G'day YouTubers and welcome to this review of the GRY Falcon 8 Bay Round Cell Charger. So a big thank you to Melody of I think it's Innova Technologies. So she mentioned some time ago, almost a year ago, that they were developing this charger and asked me whether I'd review it and they have eventually completed it and she sent it my way. If you do want to buy one of these, I've got a link below to Gear Best. So if you are interested, I think there's a slight discount if you use the link below that I've got to Gear Best. But this is a, first of all, obviously multi-bay, multi-technology and multi-size round cell charger. So it can charge nickel metal hydride, nickel cadmium, lithium ion, lithium ion phosphate, and all the lithium battery sizes. I'm going to put a little annotation here showing you the different sizes that it can do. On the back, it actually notes that it can do, I'll mention here, it can do AA, AAA, it even mentions C cells and D cells. Now, definitely not D cells. I, in their manual, they don't mention that, so I think it's a misprint on the back of the one that I've got. And with the C cells, there's an issue, there's a caveat, which hopefully they can make a design change because it would be nice if it could do C cells without any issue. But I'll show you the issue there, it's to do with sizing and contacts. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to demonstrate how it works. There are a few quirks with this. It's a manually operated device compared to the other charger that I previously reviewed where you can put a cell in and it will almost automatically start. This one you set up manually, which I don't think is a bad thing. It means as long as you know what you're doing, you're not going to have any mistakes. You manually set the voltage and the current that you want to charge at and then you hit the button for it to start. And it has got current ranging from 100 milliamp with steps all the way through up to one amp. You can charge all of these bays at one amp. It's got a power supply, which is capable of supplying about 48 watts. This at the top voltage and the top current with all the bays full will use about 35 watts. But anyway, let's get down to the bench and have a closer look. So here we go. This is the GYR Falcon charger. It comes with this AC adapter, which is rated for, it's international for 100 to 240 volts at 1.5 amp AC. And then the output is 12 volt at 4 amp. And as noted, it can, even though this is stating 4 amp, it's at 12 volt. So the power rating for this does cater for this being able to charge all the bays at 1 amp, if that's what you're going to do. It does note that it's been UL tested. Uh, there is another very good written up review of this with nice graphs and charts and even, even thermal images that I'm going to link to down below or on my website because the gent has done a nice thorough review of this if you like your written reviews. And he noted that with no problem this power supply was able to power this and he also did some installation testing of this and noted he couldn't find any problem. I was hoping to provide you with some nice power charts showing voltage and current at the same time. I've been testing this with my Metrix MTX 3293 which I still have to review but I'm having a love-hate relationship with this multimeter. There's lots to like about it but there's lots that really niggle me because sometimes it kind of auto ranges and messes up the graphs which are being logged. But anyway, some of the review will be done with this meter when we do some testing. First of all, let me just show you a couple of issues that I found. For one, where it states on the back, and I'll just show you, it notes that it can do, there we go, A, AA, AAA, C and D cells. This is a D cell, although it fits in the bay, there's no way the contact is touching the positive point over there. So it definitely doesn't do D size cells. And when you stick in a C size cell, I'll just show you, the contact point over here is just slightly too low and it's got that nipple. So what ends up happening, when you put this in, can you see what's happening? It rides up. If I push it down, it slips up. So I've literally had to rest something on top of a C size cell to enable it to charge. It will charge them, no problem, but it's just literally, if they had that up just a few millimeters higher, two millimeters higher, I think it would resolve the problem. 
and then you wouldn't have an issue. And it's a pity that that issue is there because it'd be so handy to charge like multiple of these side by side. I happen to have four of these cells. I was using this charger, which I've reviewed before, the BTC3100. And this, even though it, again, multi-chemistry, multi-size cell charger, this cannot have two C cells next to each other. So if I put two next to each other, you can it pushes one to the side. So in order to charge more than one C cell, you need a space between them. So you can only charge a maximum of two cells, even though you've got four bays, because they just didn't make the bays big enough on this charger for these. That's no problem here. You can get them side by side. You can just see they are slipping out of that top point. They do note in the manual as well, you need to be careful with thinner cells because you've got a lot of area for movement over here. So if I put a thinner cell, whether it's a double A or let's say this uh, 14500, when you put it in there, if you don't align it, you're not going to be lining up with the positive charge point over there. So you have to carefully put it on, balance it, but once it's there, it'll stay there and charge without a problem. It's just that you need to line it up. And when I get it powered up, you'll see, unless you've got it lined up, you will get, you're going to have some indication up here whether you've got it incorrectly or not. So here we go, just to demonstrate that it can fit all these various different size cells in here. I've got various sized uh, lithium, lithium iron phosphate. The two on the side here are lithium iron phosphate. We've got uh, two lithium cells. I've got nickel metal hydride, triple A, double A, C size. And you can see where the lights are flashing here. That means it's detected that you've got something connected. So if you didn't have something connected properly, if I push one to the side, you'll see that the uh, blue flashing LED stops. And as you'll note with the two C cells here, Unless I push them down, there you can see the LED is flashing, but if I release it, it clips out. Such a small little manufacturing fault. I hope they can correct it because it does add a lot of versatility if you can do all these sizes with no problem. The one thing I'll just point out during this video, glare is a bit of a challenge and especially when I've got meters on the side because the text on this is relatively small. It's not too bad when you pull it up and look at it a little closer. The one thing you're going to notice straight away, especially as I pull this up, the LCD, because the contrast and the angle, when you're looking at it straight on, you're not getting the best contrast. In fact, you'll see, you'll probably be really disappointed looking at the display from the angle that the camera is looking at it now. As I tilt it away, you'll see it does get better, and especially when I've got the reflections of it, but you will note that there are two brighter spots at either end, the kind of lighting across the displays isn't quite uniform. It's not really a problem when you're sitting in it and looking at in front of it, you can see in everything clearly enough, but just to note that, yeah, it's not quite uniform. I'm gonna turn down the lighting just so you can get a better impression of what it looks like. So if I turn off my overhead bench lights and you look at this, and then if I bring you closer into, I'll bring you into one of the ones which is more dimly lit, just so that you get an idea you'll see that it's not that bad. And that's kind of what you see with your eye when you're looking at it. So even though on the camera during this review, you'll see perhaps a fair bit of reflection because I've got the overhead lighting and what have you, what you're seeing there is basically what you'll see if you're looking at it in the right angle with not too much overhead light on it. So certainly smaller digits and characters, but certainly easy enough to see what you're doing once you've set it up and you've got your charging started. So here we go, I managed to get the lighting set up so we avoid too much contrast and you can see this nice and clearly. So the little annotations here, you've got a little battery which you'll see moving along indicating that you've got charge happening. You will have a time indicator to show how long the charge has been going on for. You've got a voltage level indicator and an accuracy or spec that they claim of 0 0.05 volt accuracy. Now that should be okay for the most part. I've noted during my testing that it can be outside of that uh, by a little bit margin. It's not quite linear. It seems to get more accurate as you get to the top end of the cell voltage level, when in some cases then it becomes spot on. I've noted that there's a fair bit of latency in the way this updates, and we'll talk about that a little later on. But when you don't have this uh, in its charge mode, 
the voltage level on here reacts quickly to what the voltage level of the cell is. But when you're in a charge mode, because I'm going to uh, play an experiment with a supercapacitor, there's a fair bit of latency in terms of actually matching what the voltage level is, depending on the cell you've got in here. And it doesn't go down. Now, I say that, I picked this up because I was playing around with the supercapacitor. When I dropped the voltage on the supercapacitor, because I wanted to see if it was going to top up, if it drained while it was in the charger, this doesn't go down for a long time. Now, in the real world, that's not going to be an issue, because you're charging a cell, your voltage level is going up, not down. But just something to note. You then got this indicator noting your technology, whether it's nickel metal hydride or nickel uh, cadmium, it can also do, and then you've got lithium iron, you can do lithium iron phosphate. This you don't set, this will be set depending on your voltage level. As soon as you step up from the 1.5 volt here up, it's automatically going to go to lithium iron, which makes sense. And over here, this chart over here, this is your current setting from 100 milliamp to 250, half an amp, one amp. Now, I will make a note here, you'll see that these are the terminating voltage levels. So these aren't the actual voltage levels of the cells. So for instance, this rechargeable AAA cell is a 1.2 volt cell, that's its nominal voltage, but of course its top end charge voltage is about 1.5, 1.6. And same for the lithium technologies, this isn't their nominal voltage level, this is the top charge level. So one, I would perhaps argue that it might have been a bit more user friendly to put the nominal voltages here, so it's far easier to set. But then perhaps someone who's got a bit more experience might want to be dead sure and know and understand what the terminating voltage level is. And in which case then you've got these straight here. So I'd say you always want to double check when you're putting a lithium cell here in particular, that you know exactly what the terminating voltage is so you don't get that wrong and perhaps damage it because overcharging or, over, or discharging a lithium cell means you could kill it very quickly. It does have a clear warning here saying please select suitable charging voltage so you need to be aware of that. In terms of buttons now in fact this is quite fortuitous you can see that the display has just dimmed out and you have to touch a button for it to come back. And I'm going to say that is one thing that annoys me. I don't understand why they uh, switch the displays off. It's not as if you're really going to be conserving a lot of energy. You've got this plugged into the mains. So just keep it all lit up so I can see the status at all times without having to come and push a button. Anyway, it's got a function button here which is used. You can, you've got a, the ability to either set individual parameters for each cell or you can go and copy across multiple cells. Now the copy function is quite interesting. If you set one of these, you can copy between two. So if you want uh, to copy across all of them, you'd set the parameter here, and then you can copy between all of them. Or I could set a parameter here and copy just across these in the middle. You can't copy, let's say, one here and copy it to an individual cell over here. It copies everything in between. That copy copies the voltage, but not the current. The current will default to one amp. You can then go and individually change those settings if you want. You can obviously then go and individually set each of these independently if you have different technologies. To demonstrate some of that functionality, I'm just gonna put this AAA cell in here. I need to put it in carefully. We can see the little blue LED lights up over there. You can see straight away without any latency, it comes up and it displays a voltage level. And as I said, this I've noted, certainly on this one, is reading on the high side by about 0.05 volts. So rather it read on the high side than the low side because then you're at risk of overcharging. But certainly I've noted there, there is a little bit of a difference there compared to my multimeter. But that difference seems to iron out once the voltage level gets higher and towards the terminating voltage. Now on here at the moment, the default settings would be correct for this cell, that you've got 1.5 volt and you can make adjustments. But anyway, let's pretend that it was a lithium cell. What you could do is you push it You'll see you get a flash over there, and then you can use a C to V setting. When you set that, current is blue, and then setting the voltage is red. 
but you, you want to rely on perhaps this indicator over here, these double arrows indicating what you're setting. Once you've set that, so if we go to the voltage, you then push the button here and you can step through the voltage levels. Now you're at no risk of this automatically starting, you have to start it manually. So I actually prefer that than rather it automatically starting. You can see the little battery gauge is giving some indication of the level that it's at. I'll then just go and select, that's timed out again. I'll go and select the current. Let's say for instance that I'm only gonna charge this at 250 milliamp. Once I've got all that set, this will eventually time out, that doesn't matter, but at any point, if you hold this down for a couple of seconds, you'll see that flash, and then you'll get an indication here that it is actually charging. Now, the interesting thing is, once we get to the test with the supercapacitors, the charge level will depend on the voltage. If the voltage is really low, for one, if it's below 0.6 volts, I think, it won't charge. If it's below half a volt, it won't even register that it's got a cell in there. So the cell needs to be at least half a volt or more. If you're below half a volt, it almost indicates that you've got a faulty cell or something's awry. At 0.6 of a volt or higher, it will start charging, but it starts charging at a lower current that's even specified here. It only starts going up to your specified charge level once it's surpassed a certain voltage level. And for instance, with some of the lithium technology, so let's say we're charging at around uh, 4.2 volts, once you go past, I think it's three volts, it'll then kick up to the full current level that it's supposed to. Once this has completed a charge, this will then turn red. So it's a bit, I would have thought they would have done it the other way around, that it, it kind of has this blue indicator to show it's finished, but no, it goes red when it's finished. The other interesting thing, which we'll see once we get to the more detailed testing, is that once it's finished charging, there is a slight leakage current from the cell. Now it's fairly small, we're gonna measure that. And what I noted is with that leakage current, if you had to leave the cell in here for an extended period of time and the voltage eventually started draining away, with the lithium cells, it'll automatically start topping them up. Although there's no indication that it's doing that, it just does that automatically while they're there. But from my research and testing, I didn't see that happening with the nickel metal hydrides or the nickel cadmium setting. When you are charging, you obviously can't change the voltage level. What you can do, you can select the cell again, that'll flash, and you can go and change. If I go and flick this up to the current setting, you can go and change the current setting even while it's charging. Now I say that, let's go and set this down to voltage. Would it allow me to change it? You can see it's flashing. Let's just see if it goes and sets it on that. I don't think it will. And no, it times out and it comes back to what I set it at, which is what it should do. Now for a demonstration on how you can copy settings. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna leave this on the 250 milliamp. We'll see that, as I said, I think it defaults to one amp. We're gonna change the voltage setting on this one to let's say 4.2. So if I go here and I click through, we've got 4.2 volts set over there. It'll eventually time out and it's set there ready for that. You'll see these ones, if I wanted to match that, what you do is you click, I think, and hold this one and then click the one that you want to go to. You see they all start flashing and when I release them, you can see they're all at 4.2. So it's gone and reset all of them. And now the interesting thing to note there it has actually copied the current settings as well. So for this setting, sorry, my apologies. It will copy both the current and the voltage settings if you do a copy like that. It's when you do a global voltage setting across all of these that it'll default to one amp. Let's test that right now. So here we go. I've got this set off. I haven't got it all in. If I pull the camera out too much, the text gets so small. But here we've got the first few at 1.5 volts set at one amp. Then we've got 4.2 set at 250 milliamp. So what you do, you hold down the function button and the CV button dial is what I'd call it. And when you do that, you'll see that I'm globally changing the voltage across all of them and it's default to one amp. So then that does that for all of them. So I'll take this up to the 4.35. I release that and now all of them are set at that value. So there is where it uses the default current level. You can, you can go and change an individual current level if you want to. So if I selected for instance, this one over here, set it to current. 
I can go and set that individually to a separate current. So it's got those three settings. You can either go an individual setting, you can copy it across certain uh, cells, or you can set a global voltage level across all of them with a default of one amp. So next what we're going to do to do some more detailed testing on the charging and how it behaves when it gets to a full charge level, the discharge and whether it kicks in automatically, I'm going to use um, these supercapacitors linked up in series to give me the, the right voltage level for let's say a lithium cell. Now of course this is a different, the, this charger isn't designed to do this but it just allows me a bit more flexibility to make some changes quickly and then we'll use the metrics meter to make some measurements as well. And here we go, even though I've gone and adjusted the current up, I've gone and set it up to about half an amp on the charger. It still uses a reduced current charge because it's at a lower voltage. So once it gets to a certain voltage level, it will then bump the current up to do the proper charge. Because the voltage level is so low, it's programmed basically to use less current. The voltage level is certainly not too far off if we do the comparison, considering there is a little bit of latency in the volt reading on the device. So this is the voltage reading which is across the uh, two supercapacitors in series. So here we go, please excuse some of the glare. I just want to show you, just after reaching three volts, it jumped up to half an amp. So I'm going to slow it down so we don't have the issue with latency. So what I'm going to do is drop this down to a charge current, about 100 milliamp. There we go, so you can see it's gone and dropped down. So I'm just doing that so we don't have the issue with the latency and we can see whether this gets to the right voltage or not. And there's just a little better view, I've got, there's a change, I did have it at half an amp, I've taken it down to 100 milliamp and we'll see how it goes up to the target voltage which is set at 4.2 volts. We want to see if the current trails off and then we want to see if it after a little bit of discharge will it automatically start charging again to bring the voltage back up. And the moment just out of interest with that latency you can see this is saying 3.79 when we've actually got 3.43. So sorry I know the text is really small on this it's difficult to try, try and film it but I'm keen to see now that I've slowed down the charge current whether the latency catches up and whether we're going to get a, a correct reflection. From what I've seen, this doesn't come down readily to a lower voltage measurement once it's gone up. So I'll just note this over time and I'll bring you back in once it's had time to catch up. So here we go, just as we're approaching kind of again the top end, you'll see here it has now moved up to 382. It never came back down. So it's funny, it's got a bit of latency and it doesn't readily come back down if there's a lower voltage. Now in the real world situation, your battery voltage or your cell charge or your cell voltage that you're charging isn't going to come down. Uh, but it's just interesting to note that it stays locked there until the cell catches up. In this case, because I've got the supercapacitor, it bounced up too high and then it came back down low. I was able to pick it up. Under normal circumstances, you wouldn't see that and potentially it's not really an issue. But anyway, you can see there's a certainly a slight error here, slightly greater than the tolerance level that they're quoting, uh, 3.78 versus the 3.84, but we'll track it to the finish and at the moment it's still doing about the 100 milliamp. So we are getting very close to our 4.2 volt target, still charging at a rate of about 100 milliamp, and we're certainly not too far off the uh, voltage that's being displayed. Uh, there we go, we're slight because we're at 4.05, we're slightly outside of the spec that they quote of being 0 0.05 volt out. What I'm intrigued to see is even though I am charging a supercapacitor, which of course is a very different chemistry, if you will, and charge rate to the normal cells that would go in here, I'm intrigued to see whether there's going to be this latency issue where it is going to stop at around 4.2 volts or go above. Because in my previous tests, when I've been using supercapacitors, it's overshot that by quite a fair bit. That's why I'm only charging at 100 milliamp. So let's see how it does as it approaches that mark. So there we go. It's hit 4.2. I would expect it soon to go from constant current to constant voltage. So it should hold that voltage and start dropping off the current. 
So let's see how it behaves. And there you go, it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So we can see the current is slowly dropping off and it's maintaining that 4.2 volt. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it skipped just slightly above that because of the supercapacitors are going to be more willing to adjust far quicker than the other chemistries that you charge in this device. But so far, it's holding steady. So I'm going to let it continue till it finishes and then we'll note what the current drain is because I've certainly noted that once it's finished char charging, there is a slight leakage current from the cell in there. And what I want to see is if I then, let's say, I'm going to put it connected to my electronic DC load, slowly reduce the voltage and see whether the charger would kick in and actually top it up or whether the charger, if you left it there for too long, would end up draining the cell if you didn't remove it. And just as another interesting note, as we're again reaching the kind of end of the charge, you can see again the current is reducing, our multimeter is getting far closer to the actual reading on the uh, charging device. So there we go, we've now hit exactly 4.2. So that error that's there certainly isn't linear. Uh, it depends on where you are on the voltage scale. But we're getting very close, I presume it's going to cut off soon then this little light will change from a blue to a red to indicate that it's finished a charge and then we'll continue with the tests. So here we go, we have just finished the charge. We can see it still says 4.2 volts there. We've got the little red light indicating that we finished a charge and that is the voltage indicated on the multimeter now that there's no current going into it. In fact, quite the opposite. This is the leakage current coming out of those supercapacitors or if you had a cell in there. So another re reviewer noted this as well. So if you did leave these in there, there is going to be a slight leakage. So what I'm going to do as a next test is to attach a load, slowly drop the voltage and see whether it will automatically kick in and top it up or whether it will just slowly discharge over time. Right, so here we go. I'm just about to switch the load on. I've set it for about 700 milliamps, so you're not going to see that here. But, okay, interesting. We're seeing 100 milliamp going back in. Now, the red light is on, but it certainly seems to be getting charged now that I've got it under load. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to slow down the draw and just confirm what's going on. Okay, so now I've actually gone and switched off my electronic DC load. So that is comforting to see. It's interesting to see though that it is actually putting charge back in. Just looking at the meter over here, we can see the voltage level is recovering. Although I say that's not being displayed, I said it's very odd. It, this doesn't go down very easily. I have seen in other testing, after a long wait, it then readjusted but there's nothing to indicate that it's putting current back in because the light here is uh, still in the red mode as if it's completed charging, but certainly it's recovering. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna leave this for a while to see what it gets back up to. And at least we can say that even if you did leave a cell in here and the voltage dropped, then certainly it would kick in and top it up again. And there we go, we can actually see that it's tapered off the charge level again and brought it back up to 4.2 volts again, although there's no indication on the charger itself, but at least it's looking after the, the lithium cell if it's left in there. I, I particularly check this on the lithium setting because when I check this on the nickel metal hydride, there I noted that it didn't seem to kick in and do a recharge when the, when the voltage dropped off. Now perhaps there it's not as critical, you're not likely to damage something if, if things drop off a little bit, but certainly on a lithium cell, if it's left in there and it drains, that could be a problem if you, uh, over time, it might be a long time, go below the threshold. But anyway, let's just quickly see if this uh, finickety little meter is gonna show us a graph of the current and how it charged. So here we go, it did finally cut off again, and that was, you can see it's got the little bit of drain again, and that's the kind of voltage that it's just dropped to. Um, let's see if this device, which has been a real niggle, will show us a nice graph of what happened. You have to excuse some of the glare, apologies, a little bit difficult with this display and everything attached. I'll just adjust the zoom so that it's easier to scroll through everything. You can see the red area over there 
is the overall and then what's depicted down here in the zoom window. So now I've included everything. That little peak up was when I think I adjusted the current. And I think because of that, the auto scaling has been kicked out. Or I actually did, I think, set a manual scale. So it's not showing too much here. If I go back to cursor, we can see the values here. There's the uh, 50 milliamp and the time. It then kicked up once it got to the right voltage level. So there we go, it's showing about 70. There we up to the 100 milliamp. And there you can see the gradual tail off. Once it had, had gone into a con constant voltage mode, it started tailing off and trickling right off. And this is the little kick up once I went and drained it and it decided to go and top it up automatically. So certainly it behaved as it should do. So there you go, that is the G what is it the GYR Falcon charger big thanks again to Melody from Innova Technology who put this in my hands all in all I think a great versatile little little charger when I say little charger it's nice that it's got the eight bays that you can charge in there are very few chargers like this where you can charge so many cells at once at let's say even an amp for all of them as noted, it does have those few little quirky things with the latency and the voltage measurement, but in the real world, I don't think that's really gonna upset what you're trying to do. Um, I think it's a pity it couldn't be a little more accurate on the voltage side, but at least it's over reading in my case, rather than under reading and let's say overcharging. The biggest niggle for me was that the C cells don't fit properly. I literally had to, you have to put, I literally had a heat sink sitting on them so I could charge them. But otherwise it's brilliant being able to charge so many things at once. I really hope that perhaps in production they can make a little change, an engineering change so that the C cells fit correctly. And then I think a great charging device. And then if you'd like to see a look inside this to open it up and see the build quality, let me know below. And then what I'll do, I'll place a separate video on my website so that you can go to my website and have a quick look. We can open it up, have a quick look inside and see what the build quality is like. But anyway, hopefully you gained something from that review. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and do remember there are lots of updates happening on my website, mjlawton.com. So go there, whether it's daily, weekly, I've got new little news posts and there's new content being added. We are, and that is, I say, Steve and myself are now working hard to get the multimeter database up there so that it makes it a lot easier to go and choose a multimeter from all the ones I've reviewed. You'll be able to go and select and pick by certain criteria and then get a list of multimeters and that's coming on board very soon. But anyway, thanks very much. Catch you soon. Cheers.